Today, I'm welcoming back my good friend, Stacy Olson. Stacy is a leadership and positive psychology certified coach and now an author. She helps leaders and professionals, many of them working parents, create more balance and less stress as they juggle being a parent, a high performer at work, taking care of themselves, and all of the other aspects of their life. Since Stacy was last on the podcast, back on episode 89, she has written a book. Her book, Your Balanced and Bold Life, should just be coming out as this episode goes live. Today, we are going to talk about some topics that she covers in the book, specifically around identifying your values, prioritizing yourself, and learning to say no with confidence. Hi, I'm Allison Edgity, a pediatric sleep and wellness coach and a mom of two. I love to help parents find solutions. This is How Long Till Bedtime. Well, hey, Stacey, I'm so excited to have you back on the podcast. First, I just want to tell you that I am so proud of you for writing this amazing new book. You had an itch to write this book, I feel like for years now. And as your friend, I was in awe watching you turn this dream into a reality. I had the pleasure of reading the book, and I'm very excited that it's about to be out into the world and in people's hands because I know it's going to inspire people to make changes that allow them to find more balance in their lives. So let's start with sharing what inspired you to finally write this book. All right. So you're right. This has been something that I have been thinking about capturing for years. And then finally, it was time to bring it out. What inspired it was really my own experience uh, years ago, burning out, working a lot of hours, and then deciding at the busiest time in my corporate career to start putting stronger boundaries in place and learning that, oh, when I actually stopped overworking and stopped feeling overwhelmed every day, I performed better and I showed up Um, as the parent I wanted to be. And I was a better leader with it. And so it really opened my eyes to, oh, there's a different way we can approach our work. And then it's, you know, what I learned since my corporate career to balance my mind is a big part of it. Calming our busy mind is a part of the book as well, uh, because we can have the time piece figured out. But if we're still always stressing and thinking about uh, things that can make us feel out of balance. And then my own um, working with so many clients over the years and them sharing their struggles and their questions and their challenges and just really wanting to create something that um, let people know they're not alone uh, with the things that they're struggling with and offer that path and help them figure out what balance looks like for them so they can be more balanced and less stressed and really wanted to be able to offer it to someone in a book that is very, you know, you can read it whenever and you can take what you want from it. So uh, yeah, that's what inspired it, my own experience, other people's experience, and just being able to offer it to people in this way. Yes. And I know many people probably could do what I did, which was wanting to highlight different things throughout the book. And there's so many great topics that you cover around finding balance, but I had to choose a couple for us to talk about. So one, I want to talk about identifying your values, and then that kind of ties into prioritizing yourself. And then the other one that really resonated with me was learning how to say no with confidence. So those were a few things that I was hoping to touch on today. And one thing that I had highlighted in the book is that you said you don't find balance, you create it. And one step towards doing that, I think a big step that you talked about was identifying your values. Can you talk a bit more about that process of identifying your values? Yes. Uh, Yeah. A huge part of it and talk about is living and leading from your values and knowing what really matters to you. What are those beliefs or behaviors or uh, ways of being that are really important to you to help guide your choices? Because when we are living in a way that is out of alignment with our values, we experience 
more conflict. We're not sure what to say yes and what to say no to. And so getting in tune with your values is a big part. And uh, I share a story in the book um, on this chapter on values uh, that ties with what you help your audience with. Uh, There was one night, it's the famous duck blanket story in our household where my son Carter, he was four and would not go to sleep. And I mean, your audience can relate with that and you help them with that, which is wonderful. Uh, and I tell the story from the lens that I was so burnt out and ha- exhausted. I had very little left to give in those moments in patience. And so we went back and forth and back and forth and he kept coming out and I was getting angrier and it was this angry battle of wills. And uh, at one point I said, if you come out again, I'm going to take his most favorite special item in the world, which was his duck blanket, it's going to go away forever. And I'm not proud of how I handled that. Um, that was um, that was my stress and overwhelm and everything just coming out. And I talk about how impatience is often a cue when we're out of balance. And so I, he came out again, the duck blanket went away, and um, he eventually went to sleep. We were both crying. And it was, you know, I didn't end up working in the evening. I wanted him to go to bed so I could go to work and the guilt was high. And it just was a huge wake up call for me that I was so out of balance, not only out of balance and not, you know, not much left in my tank, but I wasn't showing up in a way that was aligned with my values. And my family was a very important value to me and my actions showed otherwise. And it wasn't that I wasn't like, I was still a good mom and stuff, but there were those moments that when I was worn down and stressed out that I just did not handle things well and show up in the way I want. And so that was one of the key, I talk about kind of a perfect storm of things that happened that led to me putting in boundaries and, you know, take, starting to take care of myself better. Um, but getting aligned with your values matters because when you also know what matters to you, it's easier to commit to the change you want. So to your question, I kind of gave a little story there, is how do we identify our values is, you know, there's different ways we can do it. One way is to think about it is what truly matters to you, not what you think you should write down, not, you know, your professional values or your company or what you see from your friends. It's like, no, what really truly do you hold important to you? And think about some of those ways of behaving or thinking that you value. Uh, Strong emotions can often be a hit, uh, tell us what's important to us. So even the things that make you angry are usually a cue to you that a value is being hit, something is important to you. Or those stronger emotions of, you know, what gives you happiness and joy or moments that you look back and you really value and leave you feeling good uh, can give you some clues. And what I do with clients is I give some exercises in the book to help people think about what their values are. But a lot of times, because sometimes when we look at a list, we can look at all these words and think, oh, I should choose that one. Or I like this one. Even family is a big thing where people are like, I should have family as my values. But understanding it's like, no, what really, really connects with you personally and that is okay and even if family isn't a value like at the time i called it family now for me it's about being present that's really what that value has evolved into um but whatever you choose let's say i'll just use my example being present that value of being present that trickles into the strength of my relationships with my family and how i show up and so That's one thing, especially knowing your audience and a lot of uh, parents is like, it's okay if family isn't listed as one of your values, because whatever you hold most important is going to help you um, with your family and show up. And we all know family is important. So, um, but what I do is just get them to write on sticky notes. What are those, what's really important to you? Write one each on a list. And then I'm like, okay, so if you had to give me one of those values, which one would you give me? And then we just go through the list until they narrow it down, take one away at a time. And then you start to get clear on what really truly is important to you. And once you have that, then you can look at that and go, okay, how do my actions align with that? How do they not align with it? Don't be hard on yourself where they don't, but just start looking for what are those small things I can do each day that can help bring you more in alignment with your values. And when you do, you're going to have more energy. You're going to be clear on to guide your choices and it relieves some of that internal conflict. Yeah, I was doing a similar exercise like that years ago that 
made me realize adventure was one mm -hmm. of my values, which to your point of being present, Similarly, I realized, well, it does connect to my family because I wanted to go on adventures with my family. And it's when we started to really prioritize planning some trips with our kids, some small just weekend getaways where we could drive to a new place, some bigger international travel. But it was doing an exercise like you're talking about that actually brought that forward for me to realize, oh, that's a priority for me that I really value, but I hadn't really worked through that. So it's interesting how you can have these values without even knowing what mm -hmm. your values are. You have, you aren't, you can't prioritize them until you've really connected to what they are. Yes, absolutely. And then I'll also do the caveat is sometimes if you're not sure what they are, that can stop us. And so I talk about like, don't worry about getting it perfect. Just what are some of those things? And then like, you can try it out and you can play with it and, and see if that is what aligns with you. Um, but yeah, until you spend some time thinking about it and, and really until I started on this journey, I never thought about my values or what that looked like, but it, it just makes such a difference when you have more clarity on it to, you know, guide your choices. And Well, I love your story about the duck blanket. And I assure you that many of my listeners will relate to that of having that moment where you lose it and you do something or threaten something that as it's coming out of your mouth, you think this is not who I am or who I want to be. And I have a, an equally funny story. As I was reading your book and I was tight up against when I wanted to share some notes with you and I had you know this deadline in mind and I had a very hectic day and I lost my patience with my kids the day I was trying to finish this book. And as I was reading it, I kept thinking to myself, this is ironic because I am having that impatience that I totally, that whole concept totally resonates with me of I was being impatient with my kids. I was out of alignment and here I was reading a book about being balanced. And so I finished the book, I shared my notes with you and I went in and I did have to say to my kids, I finished the book that I wanted to finish and I have to tell you a funny story. And they were cracking up when I said, <laughs> here's the the point of the book and here's what I learned. And what does that make you think? And they said, well, you weren't really acting like that today. <laughs> I said, I know. <laughs> I had too much on my plate. I was trying to do too many things. And I was not in balance at all. And they got a real chuckle out of that. But I think you're point is a good one. And the way you said it, I thought, oh, I hadn't really thought about that either. It's so true for me. When I am losing my patience with my kids or my husband, sometimes there's a valid reason. But a lot of times it is because I've taken on too many things. And this leads me to something else I want to talk about is the whole say no concept. But I've just taken on too much and then I'm in complete overload mode. So I hope that people hear what you're saying around that whole concept of if you're being impatient with those that you love the most, it could be an indicator that you're out of balance. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and I'll just add, it doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect and we're always going to show up right. in the way we want. And I, and I share a question in it is just when you can like catch yourself and look at Oh, if you're feeling frustrated or even where you notice that, that's great. You notice that's important. And then ask yourself the question, is this a reflection of who I want to be or what is really important to me? And if the answer is no, that is an opportunity to go, okay, well, how could I make a different choice how I show up? And it might be to take a breather. It might be to, you know, tell your kids a story and make it a light moment of learning, um, but when we can start to like, don't be hard on yourself, just recognize there are those choices and our cues and often our emotions. They're like, I talk about, they're like our compass, their cue to tell us like, okay, don't judge it. Don't see it as being hard on yourself. Just like, that's a cue to pay attention go, okay, what's, what's going on here? And, and what is a choice I can make that is a better reflection of who you want to be and what you need? Absolutely. And so along the same lines, another area that you cover is prioritizing ourselves 
So tell me a little bit about why you think that is important for people to keep in mind when they're thinking about finding more balance in their lives, or I should say creating more balance in their lives. Yes. So uh, when I talk about this is one thing is we hear a lot that make yourself number one. And for me personally, as a mom and caring, like that didn't quite connect with me. And I always felt like, well, I got all these other people that matter and things I want to do. And so I just found like a lot of tension with that idea. And so for me, it was coming to this idea. And I talk about the book is like, you matter too. make yourself a priority too. And so it's about making yourself a priority and being there for others and finding that. And for me, that just opened it up. It's not like, all them, all me. It's like, how, I matter too. And I'm a priority too. And sometimes if your tank is really low and you're having a really hard time, like that night with the duck blanket, I probably need to make myself a priority and, and do what I needed to take care of myself. Uh, but when you can start to do this and understand that, you know, we want to say yes to everybody else and, and make everybody else happy. But if it's at the expense of your well-being or what's really important to you or running you down, that, you know, hurts your enjoyment and, and how you feel and hurts your performance and how you show up. And so when you can make yourself a priority and take care of you, you can then show up for others in a better way as well. And so just understanding that you're important and that is a very important part of being and feeling balanced is knowing that doing the things to take care of yourself, not seeing them as just another thing on your to-do list, but these are the very things that help you to feel and be your best and making that part of your day more um, is important and you'll feel better and you'll show up in a better way with people and it's okay and it's a good thing to do that. Absolutely. We just last month did uh, several episodes around maternal mental health and we talked about how hard it is when you become a new mom to remember that you matter too. And I think it's very true in those you know, early months, but I think it stays true as you enter different phases. So mm -hmm. right now, my girls do all these competitive sports and they're in multiple sports and travel soccer and year round swimming. And what I had done to make myself a priority back when I turned 40 was pick up tennis. And I have become such a better mom by having my own little outlet. And it helps me be a more patient mother and be more present. And recently I had to take, my husband was out of town and my daughters had multiple practices. And I said, you know what, to, for me to get to my tennis match, I'm gonna have to pick you up early from this hour and a half practice. You're gonna have to leave 15 minutes early so I can get back. And there was a moment where my daughter was really frustrated and I started to feel really guilty about it, thinking I'm really failing. And I had to stop. And then I did have to tell her, I am a member of this family as well. Mm -hmm. And I am happy to drive you to all of these things during the week and to take you to all your sporting events. But this is important for me. Do you think I should be able to compete in my sporting events? And both of my girls just kind of sat there and they said, yes. And I said, great. And I will let your coach know that I have this event and your dad's out of town and we're going to do it. And he, of course, said, okay, great. Good luck. And But it was hard. It felt oddly hard to make that call. Mm -hmm. What I love about that is not only did you make that call for yourself, you're also teaching your girls to prioritize themselves too as they grow up. And I, you know, when we talk about creating the change you want, I say like, find a reason why that is important enough to you to follow through. And even, you know, what comes up helps with a lot of clients that connect with what you said is like them going like, Hey, I want to be an example for my girls and my kids that, you know, I matter too. And they'll learn that they matter too and that that's okay. And so um, I love that you did that for yourself and you are also leading by example as well. I did try to remind myself of that 
when mm-hmm. they are adults, I want them to still be able to have a hobby or do something that they care about or love. And I will say my mom did play tennis when I was a kid. And there were times where I remember as a kid being so annoyed that she had to take me to the kind of daycare room at the tennis place where she went. But I do think it helped me have a hobby because I turned out just fine and I got to see her do something that she really enjoyed. And so I do think there's power in demonstrating for our kids what we hope they will have down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, if it's all right, Sherry, you shared that example of new moms. Um, It made me think of this one um, client who is a new mom feeling very overwhelmed and what she came to, she just had no time for herself. And what we work through and, and coach through is she came like just giving herself a little bit of time in the morning and figuring that out for her and just putting in a half an hour that was just for her to give herself permission that that is okay and that's time for whatever she wants and she doesn't have to clean the house or like if she has some free time to do it. And she said that alone, like just helped her feel so much less overwhelmed with the rest of her day just going, hey, it's okay if I take a little bit of time for me. And and yes, it might not have been her ideal time because she was, you know, it, it was when her kid was sleeping, but she gave herself permission to take that time for her and do what filled her up um, a bit. And it, it helped with the overwhelm quite a bit. So, And I also think learning to prioritize yourself some in your work day mm-hmm. is important and I think back at this predates when I had kids, but I've found it in a different way. But at some point I was feeling very burnt out when I was an investment banker and I decided, how am I going to make this better for myself? So I don't feel so fried at the end of each day. And Mm -hmm. I, they had a gym in the building. No one in my group was using it during the business day, but I decided to take my lunch break and go to the gym which sounds so silly now that that felt like such a big deal, but it really was. And it was an absolute game changer. So I would go work out for 30, 40 minutes, take a quick shower, come back, eat lunch at my desk. And it absolutely changed how I felt throughout the day by just prioritizing myself for a brief moment in the middle of the day to be able to refocus. And I remember watching these guys suddenly say, well, I could work out at lunch. And it almost became a little bit of a movement in the group and everyone loved it. And so share any thoughts you have on on ways people can prioritize themselves during their work day when they're trying to find balance between work and home and family and all those things. Mm -hmm. Yes. And one thing I'd say is being okay to do what works for you and what helps you. And that's a lot of the book. I have questions to figure out because, you know, you going to the gym at lunch is what helped you and it might be something different for someone else. So for people to just be okay to go, what helps me feel my best? And so, you know, thinking about a weekday, a regular, where you have a work day and like what, think of a day where you felt genuinely good in your day. And this ties with boundaries that we talked about last time, but just what, what does that look like? Like, what is your morning like? Do you have less meeting time? Do you go to the gym at lunch? Do you take a longer break? Do you take shorter breaks? And just start thinking about what that looks like for you. Uh, And then start to, you know, put one or two or three of those things in place in your day. Uh, And knowing that it's okay for you to do those things in your work, because again, not only does it help you feel better? Is that we perform better when we feel better. Uh, We are more focused and productive and innovative and the benefits are huge. And so knowing that it's okay for you to take some time for what you need in your day, um, whether it's breaks, whether it's going to the gym, whether it's going outside for a walk, um, but putting those small things in place in your day. And then another way to prioritize is just paying attention again to how you feel in your day. So what are those few things that help you in your day to feel and be your best? And that's going to help with your mental health. That's going to help with your performance. Like these are important and good to do, but also throughout your day is pay attention to how you're feeling. Like if you're feeling really overwhelmed in a moment, Instead of, you know, pushing harder or judging yourself for it, just to step back and be like, okay, what do, what do I really need right now? 
And the more that you can just give yourself permission to listen to that, and it might be like, if I'm feeling really overwhelmed and, that, and writing in the book has been a really big project and that's probably come up more where I'm like, oh man, I feel overwhelmed with everything to do right now to step back and go, okay, what do I need? And it might be to just focus on one thing instead of thinking about all the other things. It might be to take a 10 minute break. It might be to talk to someone, to ask for some help, but just being more okay to one, put those things in place in your day that help you, but then also pay attention to what you need as you go through your day and listen to that more. And then you can, when you do, you can be overwhelmed for like 15 minutes or right. an hour instead of day after day after day. Totally. Now my new version of the lunchtime gym is I like to meditate for five to 10 minutes before I launch into work in the morning. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, I am noticeably less overwhelmed and more present with the work that I'm doing and the people that I'm working for. So I think your point of finding what works for you is a mm -hmm. great one. And it might be different during the different seasons of our lives. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, I can share a story of what that looks like in a different season of your life, if that sure. works, that ties with the yeah. values. So um, it's one thing to, you know, do these things when things are going well. It's that when life gets, you know, tougher or busier, we can drop the things that help us feel better. And that's, you know, you want to keep them, they help. And an example of that, and I share this story in the book, is a couple of years ago, uh, my mom got suddenly really sick um, out of the blue. She was 64. And it was a time in my life for a few months where, you know, I was definitely tipping to the out of balance side of things, uh, but juggling work. And uh, so my mornings look like I would work in the morning and then I would drive 45 minutes to be with her in the hospital spend the afternoon, evening with her, drive back and, and did that for a few weeks. And that's what it looked like. And then, um, but through that time is I still did the things that helped take care of me. So I still went for a walk each day. I still looked for the good and hunt like kind of my daily gratitude, appreciation for the day. And I still gave myself some alone time in the morning to whether it was meditate or just sit and settle my mind. And I am certain that I went through that tougher time in a better way because I did those things that helped to take care of myself as I went through it. And uh, there was one point, and I'll just tie it back to the value story and why being in tune with our values is so important. Um, there was, you know, had she was in the hospital, she got out, they said, oh, she's going to make a full recovery and doing research on her illness and stuff realized that it didn't seem that that was going to be likely, um, but wasn't sure. And she came to stay with us for a few days while my dad was away and realized, hey, she's doing uh, worse than I thought. Um, and then she went back home. And it, I just had this feeling of things are getting worse, not better. And there was one morning, a Monday morning, and I remember uh, I dropped the kids off at school and I was, you know, feeling stressed out and really struggling with the decision of, do I drive two hours to her house to go check in on her or do I go about my day? Um, and she didn't want me to come. I think that's if she had wanted me to come, the decision would have been easy, but she didn't. She was adamant. Like, I do not want you to come. She did not want to be a burden. And I remember this one day and whenever I'm struggling, I think, what would I ask a client? And so I remember pulling over on the side of the road going, uh, okay, what is my most important value here? And let that guide my choice. And it's to be present with people, especially when they need you. And in that moment, the decision was crystal clear. And I called my husband and said, you got to take care of the kids stuff. I canceled all my meetings. And within an hour, I was on the road and got her to go to the hospital. She died three days later. Yeah. And for me and why I'm sharing that and why it connects with taking care of ourselves is one, because I did those things to take care of myself through it, I felt like I had a calmer mind and I was seeing those choices more where I'm well aware the old me when I was burning out, I would not have stopped and recognized that choice and said, I'm going to drop everything to go there. Now, again, if she had been asking me to come, I would have, and I think most people would, but uh, that wasn't what was going on. And so 
where they tie together is one, when we're more in tune with our values, again, we can make choices that are right for us and it can help guide our decisions. But I can look back at that time and I can go, if taking care of doing the things that help take care of myself through that and honoring what I needed and my values, it made such a difference in me staying balanced as best I could through that situation and showing up in the way I wanted with my relationships. And, um, and so while I was definitely was not full tank, I never got below a half. And I think a lot of people run on empty. And I talk about this analogy of a gas tank in the book, but what would it look like if you were to stay on your top half and start to do some of those things that help you? And when you start to get to your half, then go, okay, what do I need that can help me here? So powerful. It's yeah, I think it's, it's a such a great story in the sense that you prioritizing yourself allowed you to have clarity on your values and ultimately allowed you to be there for your mom. And I think a lot of people can relate to that where people they love and care for don't want to be a burden. And it's hard sometimes to have clarity when someone's saying, no, 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 no. And you have 500 things that need to be done anyway. So I I think that's a a really powerful story that you've shared and and a really good point. And the other thing that came up in that, that ties to the other topic I wanted to touch on was the ability to say no with confidence. And I think that can come at multiple angles. It can be saying no to a request, whether it be personal or professional, or in that example, having to say, no, I'm going to have to to change my schedule. I'm going to have to cancel Mm -hmm. and shift things around to be with my mom at this time. Can you talk a little bit about why it's so important to learn how to say no with confidence? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and, and I talk about with confidence and, and when I say confidence, it's like feeling that it is okay for you to say no. And, and then communicating it in a thoughtful way. And so why it's so important is that, um, and, and I think especially women really struggle with this, is like you care and you want to be there for everyone, but understanding that there's always a trade-off. There is always a trade-off. And so when you say yes to one thing, you are saying no to something else. And I talk about in the book how we're actually saying no already all the time. And so it's more about being intentional on what you say yes and what you say no to. And as you learn to say no and feel more comfortable with it, um, and you absolutely can, like I was someone who used to be a yes person and I said yes to everything. And I can say no very confidently now and in a good way, but it's always coming from this place. So I can say yes to the things that matter more. And so learning that it's so that you make choices that are more aligned with your values and your boundaries and what helps you take care of yourself and feel good and knowing that that is okay to do. Um, And so confidence is also that like kind of inner feeling that it's okay, but then communicating it in a way that you don't have to feel so bad about it or that you're doing something wrong and that it is okay. Like I'll use the example of my mom, when I sent my clients a note and my, my clients were wonderful, they're like, yeah, we get it. Go do it. But communicating in a way that said, you know, hey, I really value you and I have this um, higher priority thing that I need to uh, take care of right now. And so I'm not going to be able to do these meetings, you know, trust that I will follow up when the time is being, but just com- saying no in a way that it's like, I don't need to feel bad about it. I'm not doing something wrong. You are making a choice and you are communicating it um, in a thoughtful and confident way that, um, and knowing that it is okay to say that. And when you do get behind that, it's okay to say no, so that you can say yes to the things that matter more. Uh, it's just a more empowering place to come from and that it's okay. And that again, you're already saying no all the time. So let's say you say yes to a last minute request at work. You might be saying no to making it home for supper at the end of the day, or you say yes to, Uh, responding to emails in the evening, you might be saying no to taking time you need to recharge or even saying yes to going out with friends when you're feeling like, hey, I actually need a quiet night at home. You're saying no to that. So just being more intentional on those choices and recognize, you know, if you say yes to this, what do you say no to? And just when you become more aware of that choice and then go, okay, 
how can I say yes to what I want to say yes to and say no to something else? One, it feels better. You feel that more inner confidence to do it, but then you can also communicate it in a way that keeps your relationship strong and you don't need to be, um, you know, weird about it. And it's just okay. Say, Hey, I'd love to do that, but I um, am feeling a little burnt out and I need an evening at home tonight. So I'm not going to be able to. Um, And I give a lot of different ways that you can say no in that confident, thoughtful way. Um, But yeah, just knowing that it's okay to do. And um, I say no, like I said, all the time now, but it is always coming from this place. So I can say yes to the things that matter more. Can you give an example of someone saying no to something at work in a way that doesn't make it sound like they're saying like, no, I'm not going to help you or no, no, I just won't do it. Can you give an example specifically around work and learning to say no? Because I think sometimes we say yes, yes, yes. And then that's how we get really burnt out at work. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so the one thing I'll say is that when you're clear on what is your priorities at work and what to focus on, it does get easier to say it. But then how can you actually communicate it? Let's say you have a big deadline coming up and you need to focus on it and then you get um, a few last minute requests coming in. Um, One, so, so there's a little bit of nuance in it. So like, let's say you get a request from someone who's your most important stakeholder and it is a priority. And then you might actually need to reprioritize in the moment. But let's say you're like, no, I want to say no to this. <laughs> um, hey, thank you so much for uh, thinking of me for this event. I'm not going to be able, or this request, I'm not going to be able to take it on right now because I have some higher priority item I need to do. And then, and then there's some variation. Like if you can give an alternative, that's a really great strategy. Like, Um, I'm not going to be able to do this, but I can have someone from my team look at that or, Hey, I'm unavailable this week. Can we look at it next week? Um, if there is an alternative to give, that's a great way, especially if you want to help people. But I'll say a, but with that is also knowing if you do truly want to say no, to be okay with that and own it. And, um, just doing it in a way, bringing that positive tone and frame to it can make a big difference. So instead of even saying, hey, I can't do this, you could frame it in a way, hey, I would love to take this on. I have higher priority things. Um, And so uh, I wish you all the best in what you're doing. Uh, But so I'm kind of giving some different examples. It depends on your situation. But just thinking about how could you frame it in a more positive way? Avoid apologizing. I think especially as women, we say, sorry, I can't do this, but that teaches you to feel bad every time you're saying no to it, where come at it, you're just making a thoughtful choice here. So saying thank you for your request, um, as opposed to, hey, I'm sorry, I can't do this, um, can make a big difference. Giving an alternative, if you can. Um, Sharing a reason, if there is a reason there, without like going into explaining it. But sometimes if we give people a little bit of context, that helps as well. So it's not that I don't want to help you with that. I do actually have a higher priority thing I need to focus on right now. And so I'm not going to be able to look at it or give it the attention that it needs. Um, And just being okay with that. And I give several different examples in the book, um, how you can do that. Uh, But again, understanding that because we want to help people. And just because you say no to someone does not mean you don't care about them. You are just making a choice with your time and your energy and your focus. And that is okay to do. Absolutely. I get asked, and I think a lot of people can relate to this, to be part of a lot of things externally, but kind of linked linked to my professional experience. So recently I was asked uh, if I would consider being on the board of a new nonprofit And it was by someone I really respect, and it's a sports-related nonprofit. And they said, well, you're the perfect mixture because of what we need. We need a female on the board. We need someone who understands youth sports, and we need someone who has fundraising experience. And so I really did fit what they were looking for. And my first reaction, because I do care about what they're working on, was to say yes. And I give myself a lot of credit because I took a beat and I said, I'm not saying no, but I'm also not saying yes. I want to fully understand as you're starting to really develop and create this nonprofit, if 
this is a place where I can truly be helpful to you. And if not, I'm going to pass. And I said, here, if you want to go down this route, here's where I could be helpful. If not, here are some other people you could consider that I think could be more helpful. And so I don't know that it was the answer they wanted to hear. I later heard from his wife. Well, I heard you said no. I said, I didn't say no. I just said, I only want to be part of this. If I can be of help to them in a way that plays into my strengths and that I would thoroughly enjoy because what they're trying to do is going to take a decent amount of time. And I think there was possibly some disappointment there. I still haven't officially said yes or no, but I was really proud of myself when I walked away because I have said yes multiple times to things because I think they're a good cause. And then I get roped into it and I think I am not bringing a tremendous amount of value here. And then I'm getting frustrated and losing my patience. And so I think sometimes taking a beat to to think about it is another way that you can Mm -hmm. set yourself up to say no if it turns out that's the best route. Yeah, absolutely. And and understanding that if you take on too much, then you can feel more uh, burnt out or overwhelmed with things. And so it's okay to do that. And um, I talk about uh, one strategy is that, and this is as I learned to uh, say no more, is that uh, like a yes would come out of my mouth before I even thought about it. And so it's to pause and give yourself space to take that beat, like you said, and um, to just take some time and think about, well, what do I really want to say yes to? Or is there anything that would make it a yes? And I hear from you, it's like, hey, if I add value and this is a good fit, then I would want to do it. Um, And if it's not, then to be okay uh, to decline that opportunity, because that also frees up your time and energy for something else that might be a better fit as well. And I think it ties back to learning how to say no can reduce not only stress and overwhelm in our lives, but also help us prioritize our values and prioritizing ourselves, Mm -hmm. which then allows us to prioritize our values. So it's all kind of goes in one big circle. Yeah. And I know we talked about this um, last time I was on the podcast, but it gets easier to let go of the guilt uh, too, when you focus on what you're saying yes to instead um, and and recognizing that choice. And that really helps with clients who learn to get more comfortable saying no, instead of focused on, oh, I'm saying no to this person. It's like, well, what are you saying yes to instead? And it's like, oh, I'm saying yes to more time with my kids, or I'm saying yes to not overloading myself, or I'm saying yes to doing work where I feel I can contribute in a better way. And that, you know, it gets easier to let go of the guilt when you put your attention on that. Absolutely. All right. This has been great. I'm so happy to connect again. Any final thoughts, tips for folks other than obviously we want them to to read the book, but any anything that kind of ties all of this up with a bow? Uh, okay. Great question. So uh, what pops into my mind is a story um, in the foreword from a woman named Megan, who actually, an interesting tidbit, Um, she was a listener on your podcast and heard me a year ago when I was on your podcast and became a client and she just had such, I mean, she articulates herself well and she had such a powerful experience in what she learned. She, um, ended up being the woman who wrote the foreword in the book. And, uh, what she shared is she was talking about a story where she was feeling the simultaneous demands, um, she had a lot going at work. She was sick. Her husband suddenly got sick and all this happening at once. And uh, she was feeling like I was falling behind at work, failing at things on all fronts. And uh, it, you know, we had a co- coaching conversation through it. But what she came to the realization is that one, she was being so hard on herself and putting so much pressure on herself. And that's that's something I want to leave Uh, for your listeners is like, we can be hardest on ourselves and we put the most expectations on ourselves. And Megan kind of stepped back and looked at, okay, well, you know, maybe I wasn't doing everything I wanted to do, but she was showing up um, for the things that did matter. And once she kind of gave herself permission to stop holding herself to such 
uh, expectations and being hard on herself, that's when it was, you know, she was able to look at, well, here's what I am doing and here's how I am showing up and feel more empowered to say no to some things that she just didn't have capacity for. Um, and that she could show up with her kids in, in the way she wanted to align with her values. And so that's what I'll leave your audience um, with that, you know, we put the most pressure on ourselves and I can still do that today. Um, and so just recognize, you know, um, there'll always be more to do. There will always be things that we could say yes to. And so just coming back and going, you know, let go of that pressure, uh, focus on what you are doing and how you're showing up and feel um, you know, more, you know, okay, that you're making choices that are right for yourself. Uh, but be kind to yourself as you do, however it goes, um, because we can be hardest on ourselves and that just doesn't help. And that adds more stress. And, uh, so be okay to let go of that pressure and give yourself credit for what you are doing and how you are showing up as well. I love that. So how can people find your balanced and bold life? Uh, they will be able to go on Amazon and can get it from there or any major uh, book retailers online. And they can also go to my website, stacyolson.ca, and uh, it will be accessible there as well. Perfect. Well, we'll link to that in the show notes. And congratulations, my friend. Thank you. I'm, I'm so excited. I'm, I sometimes have a hard time uh, pumping up things I have to do, but this book, i it's really great. It's a book I needed all those years ago. It's a book I need today to stay the course. It's helped so many people. And so um, it's it's really anybody who wants to be more balanced and feel less stressed, um, especially if you're a mom or a parent, you're going to take a lot away from it. So I'm excited to share it. And I'm excited for people to read it. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to How Long Till Bedtime. To learn how we can work together to improve your child's sleep, please visit sleepandwellnesscoach.com.